got to check before I start off the lecture. Is this too loud? This is okay. So I'll try to keep it this way. Okay? <laughs> if I start screaming, please wave your hands. Okay? Just for me not to uh, make you deaf. I've got a request. I've got to prove my friends that the uh, Italian people are super fun. So I'll do a selfie and everybody just raise your hands and wave them. Okay? One second. Wave the hands. Thank you very much. Embarrassing enough for them. And let me know when you want me to begin. Them, them. <laughs> the people with the camera. Can I start? Okay, awesome. First of all, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here that late at the conference. And I would like to thank also the Code Motion organizers. Uh, we'll be talking today about monitoring big data systems and uh, doing it the simple way. Basically, it's practically not simple. Uh, but again, it's using simple open source tools that everybody can install and everybody probably knows some of them in the matter of logging, monitoring, etc. Um, okay, my a bit of introduction. My name is Demi Benari. Uh, I'm the co-founder of VPRD of Panorays. We're a startup company based in Israel, and mostly we're a big data company in the cybersecurity world. And we've developed a platform for, for chief information security officers to secure their communication and uh, actually handle handling the security threats imposed by their supply chain. But I'm not going to talk about the context of the company at all because we're talking about monitoring. Uh, I'm also what's called the Google Developer Expert. Basically, that's Google saying that I talk a lot. And uh, I'm uh, the organizer or co-founder of some uh, communities in Israel, developer communities. Uh, one of them called Big Things. The other is GDG Cloud. You have that in Italy, in Italy too. Uh, and in the past, I was a software engineer uh, at the Israeli Air Force. Uh, there, I actually developed a missile defense system. Afterwards, I worked at a company called Windward. And uh, right now, I'm uh, one of the developers, basically, also at Panorays. Uh, the agenda for this talk, uh, a lot of not funny jokes. And why the not funny jokes? Because my wife is a software engineer too. She saw me making this deck and she said I'm totally not funny. I don't care because I make myself laugh and that's the important thing. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the problem definition and the environment that we actually handle tooling wise. Uh, we'll talk about monitoring pipeline solutions in the matter of metrics, dashboards, data stores, alerting. We'll summarize things of course. But but again, what we won't handle is basically service discovery because it's a whole different subject that uh, I really can't address in 40 minutes or uh, even a bit more. Um, I just want to know, how many people here are developers? How many are ops people? In a matter of operation, DevOps maybe. And managers? Awesome. This addresses practically everybody, okay, across the board. When we start talking about big data systems and big data tools, we handle all of these kind of uh, databases, let's say MongoDB, the Hadoop infrastructure, Cassandra. We handle Google Cloud or Amazon. How many of you are using cloud service providers? Cloud is wi widely used in, the, in these days. And uh, again, frameworks like Apache Spark for distributed computing, we use them all, okay? And these practically are all buzzwords. But let's define a big data problem, okay? And a lot of people like to actually handle that with the V's model, okay? You have even the 7V model, but I really like to address only these three. When people ask me, okay, I want to like incorporate some kind of like big data tools, etc. I ask him, first of all, do you have like answers to all of these questions? About the volume, how much data do you have? How many of you actually know how to answer this, this question? 
the amount of data in gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes. Awesome. This is one of the hardest questions to answer because all of our data stores are so distributed in these days that basically you can't just do select star and that's about it. I know how much data do I have because sometimes it's an on-premise database, sometimes it's cloud served, sometimes even I have backups, etc. and I really don't know. The velocity. How fast is the data coming, okay? And in what frequency, basically? And the variety. Nowadays, we don't have like P2P protocols like we had 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. You have really dispersed data, JSON, CSVs, binary sometime, and somehow we need to combine all of this kind of data into, I don't know if single data store, but as a, our system as a data store in whole. And again, we've talked about the definition, the definition of the problem, but what to monitor. So the lowest level, the infrastructure, we all know, okay? With servers, CPU usage, memory, etc. But how many are actually monitoring your data? Because when we're talking about big data uh, pipelines, you have a lot of data streaming sometime, okay? And sometimes you're storing data. Let's go a higher level, the product, the product usability maybe. Uh, again, what features are being handled? What kind of data pipeline uh, steps are we actually um, triggering? This is important. And the biggest part, the smallest one that you, we usually as engineers even uh, don't care about is the business. One of the best KPIs that I saw, uh, I walked into two different companies. They have a huge screen with only one one number and hopefully that number is always rising the amount of money the company makes okay this is a really important KPI because practically that can justify any decision you need engineering wise if you need bigger servers or a foosball machine this works okay as long as this money uh, as long as this number raises it's okay okay all of us has, had started building systems from scratch. And this is practically how a monolith structure starts off. You have an, an operation system, which we need to monitor CPU usage, memory, disk. You have on top of it the processes level, uh, databases are processes, of course, Java processes, application servers running, web servers. And of course, sometimes you have load balancers, which might be software defined or even hardware. On top of it, you have user applications, of course. and to top it all off, you need to monitor all of these components. So you usually have some kind of like centralized monitoring system with a nice UI, shiny, red, uh, red green, and uh, all of the things that pop, you, pop into your eyes. Distributed microservices architecture. How many of you are implementing microservices architecture? Another buzzword. Awesome. So this is the complexity. Basically, we have some service A uh, that works with its own database writing into some queue. You have service B. Uh, again, writing to the same queue on top of a cache, on top of a database. Uh, we, it communicates, of, uh, of course, with a web server. That communicates with service C, etc., etc., etc. What we end up basically is sometimes division between different teams as well. Because team A is in charge of that, team B is in charge of this, and team C is in charge of all of this uh, and the analytics too. Who does this monitoring? Good question. Let's go over some basic concepts. We've talked about monitoring and what to monitor. Uh, there is the definition of white box monitoring, of actually knowing all of the components and what's happening inside and knowing if everything is ticking. Black box monitoring, I want to know if uh, the behavior of the system is okay. Okay, if the input to the system and the output to the user is fine. Of course, we need to show these things on top of something. We have dashboards for that. And we need alerting because like only looking about things, it's not that good, okay? I need to show something. I need to alert somebody if something goes wrong. For that, of course, we have the root causes for problems. And when we start talking about big data systems, we start talking the notion of nodes, okay? It's not a single server anymore. It's nodes and machines. And sometimes you have multiple nodes on a single machine, and sometimes it's distributed across a couple of machines. It really depends. Uh, 
deployment, let's define the deployment. Basically, deployment is any change. Some people say the deployment is taking my code and shipping it. I say the uh, deploying configuration is also deployment because you change the behavior of a system. And one of the most important things is KPIs, key performance indicators. We need to define the measurements of basically of if our system is working and uh, if, of course, everything works fine. Okay, sometimes everything is ticking, but the output doesn't come out that well. Uh, I'll talk a bit about an environment and a use case just to connect it to actual technology and not talk at high level in just definitions uh, at Windward, at a company that I worked at. Uh, we had a lot of uh, structured data and unstructured data. Uh, it was in the context of maritime analytics, basically what I did in the military with the missiles, I did with ships there. Uh, we had lots of geolocations and lots of metadata on top of it, arriving over time, so it was time series data, and uh, different types of messages in that protocol. Everything was encoded, but it wasn't for encryption reasons, it was basically for uh, compression reasons. And data might have arrived uh, later on time, because, I don't know, the satellite just passed through the world and didn't offload all of the data, etc. Again, geeks love schemes, so we have a scheme. Everything from the external data sources and the satellites were coming to Amazon, basically we were on top of Amazon. Uh, we, would, we used to parse the data and put it on S3. Afterwards, uh, do all of the analytics and entity resolution via Apache Spark and store it in some other data layers. Uh, as Cassandra, MongoDB, S3. In the beginning, we used to use the HDFS as well. Uh, I'm really sorry for the picture because this is the best picture for layers that I could find, but you understand what I say. We created uh, some kind of uh, data layers on top of it, and in, it was kind of a funnel. And basically, we used to downscale the data in if each data layer that we created, and we used to serve the data, of course, to the users, to two aspects of the big data world. The anomaly detection, the single point that interferes, illegal phishing, some uh, ships that uh, behave really, really uh, strange, let's say, okay, maybe somebody reporting from not the sea and some kind of mountain, that happened too. And we used to uh, handle the trends, which the single data point, I don't care. I really care about the whole market and the percentage, the larger percentage of the data. Uh, physical infrastructure of tooling. Basically, we had a single cluster of Apache Spark. It varied between 10 nodes and 300 nodes according to the workload that we actually needed. It's Amazon, it's easy to ramp up machines. And we had all of the environment sitting on top of a single cluster, which is pretty risky. Okay, you would say, why uh, mix up the development environment with the production one? We had, to, we had an SLA, basically, if something happens to development and it uh, overlaps with the risk, Resources, basically kill it. Uh, on top of it, we had orchestration via Jenkins, which is a really simple and commonly used tool. And we used uh, Java RESTful uh, API services with Obic. It's a framework on top of some open source tools that was written in a startup company called Outbrain. And of course, AngularJS with Node serving the web servers. Storing everything, of course, in multiple, uh, in multiple data syncs. Okay, let's define the main structure of the things that we need basically to monitor and we'll complete all of the things with tools uh, during the talk. For every monitoring solution, we basically need metric collection. And you actually define which are the metrics that interest you by your KPIs. We need data monitoring as well because we have a data pipeline, right? We need to store everything in some kind of data store or stores. It depends on your use case. And we need to show everything on top of dashboards. But dashboards are not actionable. We need to do something with it, so we need alerting on top of it. And, of course, logging. Who does logging? Come on, don't lie, everybody does logging, okay? It comes out from, the, from your framework, so you don't ha even need to do anything. So, let's start about situations and the problems that we need to face. Basically, we have a MongoDB uh, deployment with Apache Spark. We have a cluster of Apache Spark workers. It can vary to hundreds of servers. We have a sharded Mongo, of course, because this is the way you scale Mongo, and of course, you have a replica set. So, you have a lot of servers. Let's switch off to Cassandra. Again, a cluster working with a cluster. 
And afterwards, we need to serve the data to some kind of customers or maybe APIs or maybe even our web servers. Again, a lot of customers, a lot of network activity working with Cassandra. Problems. You have multiple physical servers, multiple logical services as well. You want scaling? You need more servers, of course, or more services. And uh, even if you have all of the data, basically you have an overflow and your big data monitoring solution becomes a big data problem itself. This is how the DevOps guy looks when he needs to handle all of that tooling and again, the digestion of network, network throughput. So let's start off with some solutions to these problems, of course. We don't want to only cry about it. Monitoring the operation system. So these are the, the basic tools that you use as sysadmins or as DevOps people. We need to monitor the CPU, the memory, the disk usage, the disk space. And we have lots of tools to do that. Basically, we have CollectD and StatsD that can report to Graphite. Uh, you have New Relic. How many have, uh, of you have heard of New Relic? Plug and play solution, even the free tier gives you a lot out of the box and you can use that really easily. If you'd like, you can pay more as an enterprise, of course, and get much more from, the, from these tools. Um, some operations on the cloud, okay? We are using the cloud. You have GCPs, the Google Cloud Platform Stack Driver. Uh, basically, it's a company that Google had acquired and uh, has in, incorporated it inside its cloud platform. You can connect it practically to any service of Google, and you can connect your Amazon account to Stack Driver as well to correlate all of the uh, metrics that you want to collect from different kind of sources. They are adding always functionality to that. You can use it out of the box. Uh, how many of you are using Kubernetes? You can connect your Kubernetes cluster basically right to your stack driver, especially if it's managed to Google Cloud. It's a simple uh, three clicks, I think. Amazon Web Services, of course, they have their own solution. They have CloudWatch. Again, out of the box, you're getting a lot from your infrastructure without doing any like anything, basically with no effort. But you need to report this somewhere, okay? It's not only plug and play cloud metrics. Of course, you have Graphite for that, and you can put practically any data sync to Graphite. If you know Kibana from the login world, Graphite, or Grafana specifically, uh, it's the porting uh, to uh, Kibana to the matter of metrics and not only logging. Graphite can sit on top of InfluxDB, Grafana, Elasticsearch, Prometheus, if you know it as well. It's a tool ca that came out of uh, SoundCloud. And many more that they are adding always. Report to where again, what happens if you have a scaling problem, okay? Uh, managing all of these tools is pretty hard. And uh, when you need to uh, hammer a lot of tools that actually throw metrics to there, it's really hard to scale that. So you have managed services for that as well. Hosted Graphite, Datadog, a lot of tools that you can actually use. Again, you need to pay for that, of course. Somebody is handling that storage and handling the scaling, but it's better than actually hiring two DevOps people, which is, you know, how hard that uh, that is connections as application developers how many of you actually used clients in front of databases like mongodb client sql server probably everybody right you are controlling the way that you're accessing these clients. So basically you can add an application layer on top of it and add your own metrics that report back to your dashboards. Okay, so what do we need to monitor and add there? It's more in the logical layer than I'm doing a select. I'm doing a select on that specific entity, etc. So we can do that on selects, inserts, updates, deletes, and opening connections, closing connections. What do we monitor? Probably everything, whatever you can, because afterwards you can analyze that and know what was the problem. You can actually take and correlate the logical structure of your data and uh, correlate that with your infrastructure. Then I know that basically a developer did that specific logical select in the system, distributed, and the CPU capped to 100% in all of the servers. So I can see that specifically counts, execution times, errors, all of this gives us great visibility on top of our system, especially if you have hundreds of servers and you can't like enter the database, this is a single server, and I'm querying whatever I want. Uh, how many of you has, had used Cassandra in the past? How fun was that? Just say, I'll, I'll repeat. 
he was hard? If you do the, your job, yes. I mean, <laughs> he said if you do your job correctly, it's okay. Not, but it's, it's a mess, yeah. Uh, it's really hard. It's a Java service basically running on top of servers. And when you need, it's fully distributed, headless database. It's really hard to monitor, okay? And especially hard to work with if you don't know the database well. So out of the box, Datastax, the company that actually supports Cassandra, gives you Ops Center. Right now, I think it's even not open source. They've closed it in the, in the newer versions. But this was a plug and play tool uh, to actually connect to your Cassandra database and get lots of metrics on the internals of Cassandra and also on the infrastructure of the servers that they have installed the agents on. But it's not enough. And sometimes you need to do extra logical things, and sometimes you want to be independent on your servers. So basically what you can do, uh, I had written a blog post that you can read afterwards, uh, you can use plug and play metrics of Graphite. Actually installing something, it's, it's a Java package basically, and ramping up the Cassandra node, and it reports to wherever you want. You actually define the data sync that you'd like to report to, and you can actually get more metrics, inner metrics, JVM metrics, etc really easily. Uh, and again, of course, you can go back to the basics using DSTAT, IOSTAT, IOTOP, JSTAC, all of the regular tools that you're using when you're monitoring a regular Linux server. This is kind of the schema of the, war, of the things, basically, if you'd like to install both of them, because you don't have to use only one. Uh, the data stacks agents are the green ones that actually report back to uh, OpsCenter, and you have the plug and play metrics that report to Graphite or InfluxDB, depending on your flavors. Of course, everything is being shown on Grafana. Monitoring Apache Spark, which is another kind of challenge. What do we need to monitor when we're using a data pipeline? Application executions, resource consumption, and resource allocation if you're using Yarn or different kind of schedulers. Task failures, maybe something actually ran, but we had failures during the process. Uh, by the way, I'm going to send the, the slides afterwards and post it on Twitter afterwards. Um, environment and amount of servers, physical OS metrics, infrastructure services that we're using during the process, maybe some kind of workflow manager. Everything is pretty much complex. And there are many ways to do that. You have Spark dashboards. You have the out-of-the-box uh, Spark UI server. After execution, you have Spark history server to see what happened and uh, how much time did everything take, basically. You can query that programmatically as well. Uh, you have the Spark master. You can query it via the Spark REST API to know how many servers you have running, how many failures have you had, and what's happening in the infrastructure side. And again, of course, it's Linux servers, and, and you can do the basics with this, that, etc. Monitoring the data. Okay, we've talked about a lot about the infrastructure. And uh, we arrive to the manner of data questions. What should we measure there? And basically, when we're forming uh, data layers, we need to know if all of the layers had been calculated and if we have some layers missing because the next layer can, can't continue. How much data do we have? Again, we go back to the three Vs problem. And of course, is all the data in the database? Uh, when it's a single server, it's pretty easy, right? You do, if it's MongoDB, you do count on the collection, you get the amount of rows that you have. But what happens when you have a distributed database across like 100 servers? Okay, on, on Cassandra, select star, times out every time. Okay, so basically you can't actually do that. But you need to do some kind of estimation at least about the amount of data that you have because when you hit the problems afterwards and you go to a consultancy company and you pay them a lot of money, they will ask you these questions. And if you don't know how to answer that, it's really hard to, to help. And uh, my friend actually defined a new, a new phrase, a new term, data quality assurance. Okay, you need to incorporate that in your data pipeline as well. So how do you answer all of these questions? You don't have to buy like really super expensive tools, uh, maybe using Splunk or I don't know what. You can do it really, really simple. We used to do that with Jenkins and Maven JUnit and run Jenkins builds with the JUnit tests, use the regular connection, the, the regular connection 
connectors that we, you've created and we've talked about, and basically do all of the queries uh, do, like the regular process. Uh, database existence, S3, S3 files existence. Is the data flow running correctly? And anything basically that you're writing code and report back metrics to your uh, Graphite or like InfluxDB server. Uh, schedule tasks. Reporting everything to, to Graphite is really, really easy. Data answers. It doesn't really matter how you answer the questions, the, these questions. Basically, you can do that with like bash scripts. But as long as you can answer the questions and query the relevant data. Know your data flow and know what actually might fail. And make it easy to monitor. Um, I'm lazy. Who's lazy? Thank you, thank you for the honesty, because most of the developers are lazy. If something is really, really hard, people won't do that, okay? So make it easy for even the younger developers to incorporate monitoring solutions. Uh, and don't trust others to add monitoring. Make it part of your development process. Basically, when I'm adding some kind of new functionality, I want to deploy that to production, I want to add the check to the Jenkins to make sure that everything is happening. And of course, everything the developers like to do, this is the DevOps fault, everything worked for me, right now it's in production, it's his side. Try to connect yourselves and your developers, if you're managers, to the development process and taking that to production as well, and it will be the responsibility of all of the people. And then it will, because we've made it easy in the beginning to add monitoring, everybody will look at that. How many of you are using Slack? Awesome. Today you have a Slack bot for everything. Slack bot ordering me pizza. Okay, so you have you, you have the ability to actually plug your production environment to Slack, to something that is instant and it re can report to your phone. It doesn't have to be like pager duty or something really, really uh, super complex and uh, people on call, etc. I can I, I'm really excited that Google Cloud has their like application which I could SSH with with my phone when I was at a restaurant. Okay, this was amazing for me as a geek. Logging. Logging and monitoring on top of it. Uh, at my company right now, we're using a tool called CoreLogix, for an example. Okay, it, it's, again, it was seamless plugging it. I, we're using Python and JavaScript. Basically, they have clients for everything. I just uh, configure that in my login configuration file, and that's it. It just ships logs to CoreLogix. Out of it comes not only storing of uh, logs, basically they have machine learning on top of it and finding anomaly detection on top of my logs. Without me defining anything, the tool actually like alerted me on things that are wrong in my process. He doesn't know specifically what's wrong, but he knows that it deviates from the regular behavior. And we found a lot of bugs in our production system without actually it knowing anything about our code. So it's pretty impressive. You have different kind of services that do these kind of things. We're using that because they're awesome and they're they like really super responsive for me as a customer. You have uh, nice dashboards and of course uh, you know Kibana. So they actually have Kibana on top of their data layers as well. It's uh, pr pretty much like everybody are trying to uh, duplicate the behavior of the Elk stack. And you have the regular ELK, of course, that you can install on-prem because you don't want to ship your data outside. Again, you have multiple servers running inside of a Redis queue. You have different kind of deployments for the ELK, an indexer, a storage on Elasticsearch, and of course, showing everything with the web UI of Kibana that is moving forward. It's a really live community, so you can use this tool really easily. The biggest problem will be scaling that. Okay, when you have, let's say, 100 gigabytes of logs a day, there the problem, the problem actually starts and then of course if you have like hundreds of terabytes it's a whole different kind of problem it's pretty nice shiny graphs flame graphs map of course everything engineers love okay we've talked about dashboards of some kind but you have another kind of plug-and-play uh, dashboard that you can actually plug to multiple data sources and show everything in one graph this is Alec uh, and Redash was actually an open source that was developed by a startup company that was closed called everything.me and Alec actually t took that and uh, started maintaining the project and he also serves Redash as a service uh, but you can install Redash uh, in your on-prem 
VM environment as well or in your VPC on the cloud. It's really easy and basically it's written in Python. So you have, if you have some kind of data store that there is no connection at Redash, it's really easy to implement some kind of connector and show everything on a single dashboard. And this looks like this. Okay, you, ha you can have single metrics, you can have maps, you, ha you can have like shiny graphs, whatever you'd like. And you can query practically any data source. Alerting. So all of this monitoring and metric collections is pretty useless if you can't do something actionable on top of it. So you have alerting tools that you can plug and play with your metric uh, collection solution as well. So uh, we had used Siren in the past. It has integration to practically anything. Uh, it's open source, so you can actually add all of your code if you'd like to do something pretty different. But it reports to emails, to PagerDuty, to HubSpot, to Slack. Practically anything that you're using. It's pretty easy. You have like a nice dashboard to show everything as well. So let's summarize. Stack-wise, we've talked about the problems and the things that we need to address. We've answered all of these things via tooling, of course. So in the metric collection side, we have CollectD and StatsD. Uh, on the data monitoring side, we have Jenkins that we can automate many, many other things. We store all of the things on Graphite, InfluxDB, or practically any database. We're using right now uh, at my company, Mongo, also as a monitoring database. Okay, we're putting some kind of metrics, and we're doing queries on Redux to actually show all of these metrics. Uh, we need to show everything on dashboards, so basically what we have is all of these dashboarding uh, solutions, and on top of CoreLogix as well for log monitoring, and for alerting we do Siren or different kind of uh, integrations into Slack, or basically sending emails works too. Okay, we have emails on specific uh, pinpointed user actions that we'd like to know, so all of the management actually gets emails about that. Again, stop thinking this way, okay? Worked fine in dev, everything worked on my computer. Right now I've deployed the code and this is the operations problem. And this is what actually forms all of the biggest problems in our development process. It annoys both of the sides. Try to be as cooperative as possible. If the developers, for them, it will be easy to actually deploy code and see what's happening in the production system, they will be, or we will be, super cooperative to that. Who does monitoring in the company? Everybody. Everybody does monitoring because it's easy, right? We've made it easy. Conclusions. Correlating the application and system metrics is super, super important because knowing that something is wrong and the server is in 100% 100, uh, 100 CPU or the disk is full doesn't help me much. I want to know the root cause and what, what actually caused that to prevent that in the future. So it's super important to correlate what we're doing with how we're doing it. Ask the right monitoring questions. Okay, Know what your KPIs and then ask what do I want to monitor. And of course, answer it with dashboards and not things that can't be automated because this will be really, really hard for you to do. Keep it simple, okay? Uh, not always is all of the solution is simple, but try to keep it as simple as possible without installing super expensive tools or super complex tools. Alert about things that you can actually like act on. Don't alert uh, about something that the solution is a restart. Automate that and make it restart and then aggregate all of the amount of restarts that I had done for me to actually know that there is a problem because a service might be restarting every second and it's pretty crappy. Uh, measure whatever you can because storage is like in nowadays really cheap and try to store as much data as possible for you to do for you to be able to do analytics on top of it afterwards and of course monitor your KPI business why because this will be kind of the the reason for the management or for different kind of uh, aspects in the organization to help you afterwards because something is wrong you can actually explain that and not say, oh, this is too complex, I can't explain it to you at all. Okay, sometimes it's salespeople, sometimes it's people that don't know technical things. This will explain them much better because you've defined the KPI together with them. These are business people and these are the measurements that actually came from these KPIs. So I need more money. So I need you to give me uh, like features to implement slower. I don't know, something like it. And again, if I hadn't convinced you, graphs are really, really cool. I can actually look on a graph, on a monotonic graph, for hours, okay? 
after talking really, really quick, are there any questions? Anything that you'd like to consult about? Yes. How much it costs? Okay, it is really general. What is it? The, yeah, uh, the, all the tools, all the stuff that you describe us. Okay. Uh, In general, a lot of stuff. All, almost all of these tools are open source. Okay? Zero. But when you're handling uh, scale issues and managed services that you'd like to use, most of them have the free tier that you can plug and play and uh, use really easily. But when you're starting to handle like hundreds of gigabytes of metrics per day, this costs. But again, it will cost you money on your... One second. Okay, they finished off clapping. Um, somebody will, will be needing to actually handle that data, right? So it might be your IT guys or might be an external service. And I think like paying tens of dollars a month for some kind of service to, to store that data, it's pretty easy. And I really know a lot of IT people and DevOps people, which actually for their own ease of management, pay for the services at their company without getting refunds because it's much easier to actually store that in that manner. Again, it's $10, $15 sometimes a month and it makes your life much easier. And they get refunds maybe or whatever. But again, when you're hitting scale, this will be the part that you'll actually start paying money and sometimes it's worth it. Yes. Uh, what, one second. He, uh, he afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, for one log second. analysis, oh, uh, it will be easier. I don't remember the name of the product uh, you uh, you mentioned. Which for log one? analysis, uh, the one that. Uh, mm, well, uh, you said that. Uh, uh, Gave you uh, some insights uh, on ah, okay. things that were going on wrong. On the logs. Yeah. Uh, Corologics. Corologics. Uh, yes. Can you give an example of insights that it gives you automatically? Uh, yes. For example, the behavior of some bot that actually d did scraping on top of something. And there were a lot of failures, but the end result was pretty okay. And when the user actually saw something, everything was okay. But I had a lot of like network communication outages. Okay. So the end product was pretty okay. As a user, I would never like seen any problem, but I saw that like 20% of our like outgoing, outbound uh, network requests were failing. Does it use something like machine learning or something like that? What? Uh, does CoreLogic use... Uh, yeah, they use machine learning because okay. they, I haven't defined any rules. Okay. They don't know how my code runs. Basically, they know the pattern of the logs on a regular basis, and then uh, on a specific day, something happened and there was a peak of, of some kind of like weird things in the uh, loggings they it's didn't know it was it's, uh, it trains itself uh, it doesn't need any it, it doesn't need you to to train him no 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 right. it doesn't need anything because they train themselves they basically okay. input your logs I, I ask them they actually take the logs a lot of clapping <laughs> They actually, <laughs> they actually take the logs, they uh, parse it, and they logically store that in some kind of data structure. And afterwards, they do machine learning on top of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you had a question. How many people do you need uh, for handling one of the systems you have described? Uh... OK. How many people do I need to be handling one of the systems or all of the systems. At the previous company, basically, we had me and another team leader part-time doing that, like around 50%. It was more of the DevOps side, but adding more tools, this was the thing that actually like took the most time. Right now at our company, practically everybody are doing that on a really low percentage of time. Because when I'm adding a new feature, I'm adding something, I'm adding the part of monitoring, like I'm adding tests. So basically, when it's part of your process, it's part of your culture, and it's not percentage of the job, it's basically another thing that you're doing. It's psychological. Yeah? It's psychological, really. 
there is somebody that knows practically everything, okay? Uh, somebody that you can ask questions and he's the expert, but he's not doing all of the job. That's the important thing. Hi. How much would you suggest to go open okay, source? Okay, now I can't hear anything at all. <laughs> How much would you suggest to go open source? Nothing, practically. Yeah, T try. I'll try to read your lips. I would, I would actually suggest, the question was about open source. And how, how do I suggest, the, like, how to choosing the open source? I'm suggesting, first of all, take the free, the free version of an open source, try handling it in small scale, see if it fits you and you, it's easy for you to use. If not, pay money for somebody that actually handles that. Let's say ELK, if it's expensive for you to actually manage an Elasticsearch cluster, pay somebody to do that. There are like, I know, five different solutions that can do that because again paying a hundred dollars even or a thousand dollars a month is much easier than actually hiring a DevOps guy that will be much more expensive and they do that this is the, their expertise banks sometimes have problems of exporting the data so this might be problematic but again as long as you can you're on the cloud you can ship it it's okay any other question guys thank you very very much you're great.